So uh, as we established, we're going to talk about supporting neurodiverse students in the classroom and what all that entails. Um, and I should say what some of that entails. Uh, as I briefly mentioned, not everything's going to work for everybody. Uh, some things might be really, uh, really like feel bad for some students and work for other students that are neuro neurodiverse. And I think that that's just sort of like, um, that can be frustrating, but it's also sort of like the wonderful thing about humans, right? That not everything works for everybody and we get to uh, bring our our own thoughts and opinions to the table, but also our, our bodies and our brains work differently. And that's kind of cool. Um, so again, I am Lindsay Vreeland. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator for CITL. Uh, by the end of this workshop, the goals are that we're able to recognize uh, a broad range of neurodivergent conditions that have various needs. So not everyone who's neurodivergent is going to have the same needs. And even if you have the same diagnosis or if you don't have a diagnosis but you uh an official diagnosis if you're self-diagnosed or um presumed to be something um we're going to talk about developing strategies um, to support students and foster positive learning experiences for them and uh learn ways to create courses with accessibility built in baked in from the beginning um and to create uh, courses where students are um, encouraged to advocate for their needs and to ask for things as they occur to them. Let me stop sharing my camera really quickly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, what is neurodiversity? Something that uh, comes up a lot is that people don't understand uh, what neurodiversity means um, and they lump it in with disability. Sometimes those things overlap, sometimes they don't. Um, and sometimes uh, the DRC can create uh, accommodations for students that are neurodiverse, and sometimes they can't, again, because it might not necessarily be recognized as a disability, it might be self-diagnosis, so there's not quote-unquote correct paperwork to back that up. Um, but essentially, this term is used to describe uh, the variety of brain functions, behavioral traits, and mental health conditions that people experience and saying that uh, people's bodies and brains are responding differently. Um, a lot of this is built based on this idea that we had a norm and we expected people to behave in quote unquote a normal way um, and people are diverting from that. Um, but I think that uh, like as time has gone on, we're thinking about this differently, we're understanding this differently and uh, neurodiversity and uh, claiming the identity is not um, considered to be a bad thing anymore um, by people who have that uh, diagnosis or claim that identity. Um, but also we shouldn't think of it as a bad thing either. Just like disability isn't a bad thing. It's just the way that your brain or your body is. Um, it's describing that it's not uh, saying that you are uh, that you or your students are lesser or um, more difficult or more complicated. Um, so we're seeing a rise in numbers of people who are neurodivergent uh, recently. So fifteen to twenty percent of people are neurodivergent as according to what we believe currently. Um, and we're seeing more people diagnosed than ever, um, especially over the pandemic with isolation, um, with people really having to step outside of 
what was their routines. Um, like we're seeing more people recognize themselves as being neurodiverse. And we're seeing these diagnoses because there's less stigma around it. We're seeing people that are uh, comfortable taking on that uh, the identity. Um, there's less masking going on. So uh, pretending that specific things work for your body or work for your brain, people aren't doing that as much anymore. Um, we are recognizing that a lot of people that are quote unquote high functioning or high performing, um, which are uh, problematic uh, ways of describing people, um, I want to acknowledge. But this idea that a lot of people are, um, especially in academia, uh, there are a lot of us that were able to sort of like hyper fixate on um, reading our books and studying and uh, fixating on our papers and our research and whatnot. And so uh, we were able to uh, skirt by diagnosis because we were considered to be good students and uh, not necessarily a quote unquote problem in the classroom, especially. Um, and that's where we're, we typically saw a lot of diagnosis before. We saw them in the classroom. Um, there's a greater awareness of behaviors that are associ associated with neurodiversity. Um, and with the pandemic, there was an increase of stress. And as I said, a break in routine, which uh, affected some people more than others. And we recognized some of those uh, some of those behaviors a little bit differently, a little bit more. Um, and there's an increase of self-diagnosis. A lot of it goes along with social media, which is a blessing and a curse for many of us, right? Um, but we're seeing this self-diagnosis and people understanding um, who they are and what they need in ways that can be super, super empowering, um, but also confusing at times. So I talked a little bit about this, uh, this idea of, of being good students and so maybe not getting um, diagnosed or um, recognizing your uh, behaviors as being something that might put you um, into the category of somebody who is neurodiverse. Uh, but we glorify and normalize a lot of uh, skills that come along with neurodiversity that make students appear to be good or dedicated. So hyperfixation, manic energy, insomnia, perfectionism, eagerness to please, all of those things are considered to be qualities of a good student a lot of times, but they can also be like very, very harmful for the people that are experiencing those things. Um, if you have ever experienced mania or insomnia um, or hyperfixation to a point where you are experiencing um, the inability to sleep or to uh, think about other things, that's very destructive to uh, like your brain, <laughs> but also to your body. You need to be able to uh, to be human at the same time and to sleep and to uh, hydrate and to uh, foster relationships. Um, and at the same time in academia, we also tend to trivialize and dismiss um, students that are prioritizing their well being, and especially when it uh, impacts their productivity. So, students that are choosing to sleep instead of um, turning in that paper at midnight. Um, someone who went and got food instead of coming to your office hours. Somebody who's working on their friendships and relationships or attending um, therapy or doctor's appointments during your class time. Um, I mean, even things like hobbies and uh, 
traveling home to be with family, they could disrupt what's going on in your class or students' ability to finish work for your class, but also uh, those moments of escape can be very, very good for their brains and for them as like individual people. Um, ideally, someone's not regularly scheduling therapy during your class time, but also uh, I think that we need to be aware that students have, you know, limited schedules and they have like some very uh, necessary needs going on that uh, might make that happen. Some of us might be familiar with spoon uh, theory. Um, I, I've seen fewer people aware of fork theory though. Um, spoon theory can apply to uh, neurodivergent people, but is often applied to uh, disabled people. Again, sometimes that overlaps, sometimes that does not. Um, so the idea that you have a finite amount of energy for the day, so you only have X number of spoons. Um, and once you give up those spoons for the day, you're done. Like your energy is depleted, you are exhausted. So for some people, it might take one spoon to shower or one spoon to show up to class. Um, and for other people, that might be nothing that registers for them. Um, you know, all of their classes in one day might be one spoon. So this idea that um, the energy and the effort doesn't look the same for everyone. Fork theory is specifically something that applies to uh, neurodivergent people. And um, this idea is that you start the, the day with zero forks and um, every time something you uh, challenges you that stresses you out or um, makes you become very frustrated, um, you add a fork. So it comes from this idea of stick a fork in me, I'm done. Um, so for those of us that are neurodivergent, if your clothes are uncomfortable, you got an itchy sweater, that might be one fork. Um, if you have, uh, something physical going on with you, like a migraine, if you have to call about something, if you're hungry, if you have too much caffeine, if you have not enough caffeine, um, all of those things can really impact students' abilities to come to class and to be uh, mentally where you need them to be to learn. So whether uh, they're running out of spoons or they've got um, all of the forks they can handle when they come to your class, uh, just be aware that students showing up to class is, is like amazing in and of itself. Ideally, we want them to um, be in a place where they can be actively learning and engaged. Um, but sometimes they come to class and they are overwhelmed. They're shutting down. They need to, uh, reset. Um, and there's not much we can do about that. But there are some things that we can do to make it easier for them when they come to our class and they're feeling those things. So regardless of students needing, uh, like running out of spoons or having a bunch of forks, if we have students um, coming into our classes, if they know what's coming, if they've had assignments scaffolded for them, if they aren't being punished for making mistakes, especially on like, uh, assignments or, um, you know, whether it's homework, if they read the wrong chapter, um, if they aren't being treated as lazy or that they're scamming, all of these things um, can, can really add up to make it so that students are more likely to be successful and so that they're more likely to be able to to manage the workload of um, your course. And of course, we have to keep in mind that students have multiple classes, right? Um, even if they're not full-time, they're usually doing other things too. 
So um, a lot of people get confused, get overwhelmed, and they're coming to your class with those feelings still holding over from, you know, their previous class where they were made to feel silly because they walked in late or they didn't do the uh, practice, um, the practice assignment right or whatever it was. Um, so it's hard to shake off those feelings, but if they know what to expect from you and from your class and from the assignments, they're more likely to be successful and uh, be able to manage what's going on. So I've broken, broken this down into three main ways of supporting neurodiverse students, um, looking at assignments and assessments, looking at class policy, policies and management and communication. So some of these things you've already um, set in stone a little bit, right? Where we've, uh, we've started the semester, we're in it in a few days. Um, but there might be minor tweaks that we can do as we move forward in the semester or think about what we might wanna tackle um, before we start next semester too, right? Um, always, always planning ahead when we're teaching. Okay, so assignments and assessments. Some of you are already doing these things, which is amazing. Um, I would not be surprised if most of you are doing a lot of these things. Um, but I do want to make sure I talk about them, but also like you have that reinforcement that you're that you're doing some things that are great. Um, and that's always helpful. So make sure that you're creating opportunities to discuss your plans and your choices. So uh, sharing a schedule early and often, letting people know, okay, this is what's coming up next class. Um, this is when we're gonna have this uh, exam. This is when the essay is gonna be due. Having a clear and predictable schedule for class meetings and share what the next day's tasks are. Um, so reminding them, okay, we're going to be reading this for next time or double check your schedule. We've got readings on there. Um, whatever you can do to make sure that when they're walking out of your class, they have an understanding that there's more expected of them. Um, so many times students aren't looking at schedules. They aren't thinking about things. Um, their mind is wiped clean. Um, in really, really fascinating ways, but uh, frustrating ways too, after they leave the classroom. So we want to make sure that they uh, take note that there is something coming up. Um, if students have requests, just explain why you can't meet them. Um, this really does go a long way. Uh, if you have specific deadlines that exist that you cannot move, explain that. Um, explain the deadlines that you have to meet too, as um, people who have to get grades into the university by a specific time. We can't wait forever for people to turn in things. Um, one of the big things I tell my students is like, this is when you need to have this, you know, whatever final project in for the semester. Um, and I tell them, I get to be a human too, right? I have to eat. I have to take my dog out to go potty. I have to be able to sleep. If you're turning in things, you know, um, the night before grades are due to the university, I don't get to do those things. And that's not fair to expect that of me. Um, so we have a mutual understanding of what's coming on for the semester, but then I also don't expect them to uh, skip meals or sleep or not take care of responsibilities when they're turning things in for me either. Um, and also if, if there's something you can't meet because you have an expectation of students, just explain that. Um, some of us talked about this stuff at the beginning of the semester, but revisiting those conversations can be really, really helpful, um, and really contextualize what's going on and why it's going on. Um, I highly recommend not having any surprise assignments presentations or quizzes. 
um, that causes a lot of anxiety. A lot of us are very anxious about having to do um, write essays during class in a blue book or having to take an exam in class um, with a timed element. And so any sort of uh, surprise stuff can really, really stress us out and can be um, more overwhelming than helpful to determine like what our understanding is of something. Um, if you are going to, uh, if you want students to respond to specific things, um, you know, share those questions and directions so students can continue to refer to them. Uh, this might be something that only, you know, three students out of 50 in your class need, um, but it's really great to, for those three students that, that need them to have an understanding of what's going on and to be reminded, okay, this is the parameters of this. These are the questions that are going to be asked. Um, this is what's expected. Uh, make sure you're zooming in and zooming out. So um, hopefully you're scaffolding assignments and uh, making sure that they understand some uh, basics of what they're supposed to be doing, what skills they need, um, how these things fit into the course. Um, remind students why they're doing the work that they're doing. Is it leading up to a larger project at the end of the semester? If you're working for um, within specific programs in the university, you might be helping students get certifications at the end of completing their courses. Um, it might be acceptance into the next class. So contextualize that, uh, remind them what they're learning and why they're learning it because it helps them um, become motivated in order like the or focus on, you know, those specific skills so that they really just understand why they're doing those things. Um, otherwise, it becomes this idea of you're doing it because I told you to do it. And um, students in general don't always respond well to that, but especially for uh, some of our neurodiverse students, they might just see it as busy work and not something that is uh, going to be important in the long run. So not necessarily something that they want to spend their time on right now. Um, especially if something else seems more important. Um, and some of that stuff too might just be reminding them like this is worth X amount for your grade um, so that they don't get caught up on tasks that aren't worth as much. Um, create opportunities for additional support. So uh, students could create their own study groups or reading groups or writing groups, whatever uh, is relevant for them. You can encourage them to do that. You can even um, create spaces for that, create an online room, um, create opportunities for you to attend that as well so that uh, you can answer questions um, as they come up. And also uh, encourage or offer opportunities for body doubling or parallel work where it's just maybe a quiet work room um, where everybody can focus on their work at the same time in those spaces. There are so many students that just don't have quiet spaces to work on campus. Um, the library is not quiet. Student center is not quiet. Um, there's like one little space in Watson Hall, like uh, that there are a couple desks off to the side that's like the quietest space that I've seen on campus. Um, but if we don't give uh, students time and space to work on things, they might find it really difficult to um, break their schedule up in a way that they understand where they can work on things. Um, giving options and uh, multiple applications for assignments. So if we can allow students to incorporate their interests, not all of us can do that, right? Um, there might be specific things in math that they just need to learn 
um, principles of geometry or whatever. Um, but maybe students can choose the medium of their assignment. So maybe they could create um, a public service announcement instead of a speech. Maybe they could do an interview um, with somebody in a podcast form instead of writing an essay. Um, and when we give students those opportunities, they tend to do more work actually in the end, um, which is interesting, but they're able to focus their energy on something that's interesting to them and maybe build off of skills that they already have. So they are willing to do the work, they're willing to spend the time and it sticks with them in a way that it wouldn't otherwise just by forcing them to write an essay or take an exam. Um, introducing and normalizing tools, tech, apps, and methods to accomplish goals. Um, so, so many students um, I have come to realize don't even know that they have Word for free, um, which is honestly shocking. Um, so if they don't know that they have <laughs> Word and Excel and all of these things through Office for free, I'm going to guess that they don't know about the task element to Office where they can actually set up reminders and check off lists. Um, so showing students, um, whether it's just creating a video and putting it up on your um, Blackboard or sharing your screen and showing them how to use these things, um, just showing them how to do this stuff offering to help them set up, uh, even if you don't know how to do it, if you could just sit at a computer together and try it um, and show them organizational tools for scaffolding and reminding themselves. Um, students don't know about read aloud functions. So for uh, some of us reading large uh, sections of text, it just does not stick in our brain. Um, and so we have read aloud functions on the office programs. And um, there's a program called Natural Reader for eBooks um, that works with PDFs and other documents. Um, it's a free, uh, or there is a free version of it and a paid version. I talked to another um, professor about it at the beginning of the school year. She followed up with me and said that her students love Natural Reader. Um, a lot of them ended up paying for it and they said that it's worth it because if you have an ebook that doesn't have um, an audiobook version, they can listen when they're on the treadmill, they can listen when they're walking between classes. Um, and it really helps them get through their readings in a way that feels. Um, like something they can actually focus on and something they can actually do. Uh, if you see that you have 50 pages to read for some students, that just feels overwhelming. But if you can listen to them instead, uh, that feels different. Um, showing students the organizational apps that are available. As I said, Tasks is available through Office. I use Tasks every day. Um, showing them that they can set up an Office or a Google Calendar. Um, even showing them how you organize your own um, is, is super helpful. There's also other organizational apps like Evernote, Todoist, Fair, Brain Focus that would uh, help them organize their, their tasks and the things that they need to do if they um, don't like to make physical uh, lists. But of course, they can do physical lists. Um, make post-it notes and put them on their doors, their mirrors, their computer. Um, just mentioning these things to students, I'm uh, honestly so surprised that some of these things have never occurred to them, um, but they're learning how to organize their own lives right now. So some of this stuff is gonna be completely new. Um, so just talking about it, talking about what works for you, um is always super helpful also um i don't know if you all have uh, experience with this too but 
students, um, a lot of students don't create clear names for their documents. So you'll get uh, documents submitted that are the document 178. Um, and so just showing them um, how to create folders or explaining to them like, and again, you don't have to show this necessarily in class, but like sharing a link, um, showing them all the cool things that you can do in um, in Office and the applications and showing them how they can create folders for all of their classes, um, how it's helpful if they create clear names for their documents such small things, but they go a long way, um, especially for those of us that have students that submit historically, like over and over and over again, the wrong version of a document or the wrong document altogether because nothing is named correctly. Um, making sure that we are um, creating opportunities for kindness and care. Um, if you have assignment deadlines and students aren't going to be able to sleep to meet those things, um, yeah, maybe they need to manage their time differently. Um, but making sure people know that they can have extra time, um, because it's like an actual health concern if they aren't sleeping. Um, just being, sharing that with students, uh, creating opportunities for them to get extensions and not to explain, um, why they need that is really, really important. Um, I would rather have a student turn in something late than to end up in the hospital, um, because they haven't been sleeping and they're experiencing psychosis. Uh, that derails my my class and uh, my experience with them in particular, more than giving them a 72 hour extension. Um, creating opportunities for mistakes and growth, uh, letting students understand that the process of learning is not getting everything correct the first time um is really important and also you know maybe that's something where you allow them to do revisions or redo one assignment um because again maybe anxiety was overwhelming maybe they misunderstood directions um maybe having a closed book uh test with the very specific time limit is not something that works well for their brain um so is that necessarily necessary that they don't have a book available to them um, or they can't refer to um, some sort of guide? Um, OK. Uh, I also want to briefly talk about um, policies and management. So thinking about um, the way that we manage our classes some of us are going to manage them differently than others. Those of us that have labs or have very big um, groups of students, you might have um, more firm policies than others. But um, creating space for students to move, to eat, to drink, to fidget um, might be necessary for them to be able to focus on your class. Again, keep in mind that some of our students are going to be coming from other classes and may have back to back to back classes. So uh, actually being able to move their body to uh, nourish their body is something that might be necessary, whether or not they have uh, accommodations for that or not. Um, and if you can create a space for that to happen where it can happen safely, uh, that's great. If you're in a lab and they can't be eating and drinking, understood. Um, maybe we have a time where people can go out and get a sip of water or something if they need it. Um, allowing stu students to use fidgets. Uh, there are many fidgets that are quiet. If you have a lot of students that seem to need fidgets, um, especially if their fingers keep going to their phones, because that's something that um, a lot of people do now. They're 
Um, we talk about people being addicted to their phones and, you know, that's probably an element of it too. Um, but a lot of us just want something tactile. So if you can have pipe cleaners in the class or if you can encourage them to have um, something that is quiet, uh, I have smaller classes, so I'm thinking about investing in some koosh balls because um, I'm a millennial and forever love koosh. Um, but if there's something inexpensive that you can do in the classroom or encourage other your students to bring in something um, for them, for themselves, like do that, especially if it's something that is quiet. Um, and giving students an opportunity to leave the classroom if something is overwhelming, overstimulating, um, especially for group work or especially if they're like trying to di digest information, um, allowing them to leave the room, re-regulate, and then come back into the room or leave the room, work with a group in a quieter space, and then come back into the room is really, really helpful. Um, I think a lot of us have had classes where we've either um, been students or we've had students that want to talk all the time and might sort of dominate the conversation. Um, and some of those students are neurodiverse and they're just excited to uh, have someone to listen to them and to be part of the conversation and have a lot of ideas. So, uh, giving students space to talk if they want to talk um, is great. Um, just trying not to dismiss them, um, giving them a chance to talk to you after class if they're getting off topic or if they're making personal connections and that's not the time for it. Um, even emailing them afterwards and saying like, this is so cool. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that, but um, let's catch up about that later. Just letting them know that um, like not shutting them down and creating a situation where they feel like they can't talk or that they're annoying um, is is really helpful because uh, a lot of times they are meant to feel that way. Um, let students be themselves. Um, we have a lot of ego issues, I think, when it comes to managing our classrooms. Um, but we should hopefully understand that students shouldn't have to behave in specific ways in order to uh, receive attention or praise or help or respect. Um, so if students need music during a uh, class, as long as it is something that you can't actively hear and is not disrupting other people, um, create space for that. Um, I don't think that uh, behavior that is disruptive and mean uh, should be excused, but we can also work on the ways that we address those issues. Um, we hear a lot about gentle parenting uh, and how uh, that, uh, how to approach difficult topics with students or with, uh, excuse me, children. Um, but it's really gentle communication tactics. And so if you can talk to somebody whose behavior that you believe to be disruptive or disrespectful and get an understanding of why that's happening, that might be super great. Because I think that that's something too that we uh, see with a lot of students is that uh, they're not being understood. And so that's creating a, a difficult situation for other students in the classroom, for uh, the instructor, and it can cause students to just shut down and um, stop wanting to come, stop making contact with the instructor. Um, communication. Uh, maybe some of these are um, seem pretty straightforward. But uh, creating opportunities for students to connect with you in, in various ways and at various times. Um, so even if you're not going to respond to emails over the weekend, if that's like your boundary, um, love that, by the way. Um, 
encouraging students to email you when they have the question. Um, so if it's 3 a.m. on uh, on Sunday, that's fine. Uh, tell them to send the email when they have the question and uh, never say anything negative about that or say that it's uh, rude to send the email um, when they have questions. Um, if they are advocating for their needs, um, try to adapt and, ex and assist, be willing to meet students where they are, um, and don't become suspicious or frustrated that the things that you're doing aren't working or um, that you need to change up what you're doing. Sometimes uh, people think that uh, people asking for things uh, is because they're trying to get one by you or something. Um, but hopefully we are entering um, relationships with our students with this idea that we are here to help them learn. And so we're going to meet them where they are. Um, it sounds like a lot of you based off of what you talked about at the beginning of uh, the workshop are, are mentally there. Um, and be aware that not everybody who is neurodiverse, again, is going to have accommodations, is going to have paperwork or something from the DRC to back that up. Um, so if they're asking for extra time or if they're asking um, to record lectures or do something that maybe is not something that you're used to, um, consider if you would uh, tell somebody who does have accommodations, no, um, that you're not willing to do that. And uh, again, talk to them about why that does work, why that doesn't work. And keep in mind that you're not going to regret kindness when it comes to uh, students. Um, and especially if students are able to be successful because of that. Um, and again, with communication, um, we want to make sure that we're talking through tasks, that we're talking about what we're going to accomplish, and that we're giving students opportunities to reflect on and process new concepts and tasks. Do they feel comfortable before we're, they're moving on? And I want to say that all of these things apply to all students. Um, they especially help neurodiverse students, but um, there's instances where per, uh, where students that are not neurodiverse could be overwhelmed, could be dealing with illness in the family, could be managing a full-time job in your class. And all of these things help everyone regardless. Okay. Can so, I add something real quick? I'm really sorry. Yes, I would love that. So um, you mentioned earlier that like if someone doesn't have um, basically documentation, some of us, I don't know if anyone thought it, like we need medical care to be able to continue in. And if not, we're opted in. A lot of doctors don't like to listen to us if that's what you're thinking. And second of all, um, please do not, if you are going to deny a student's accommodation and they do have it documented, please go through the DRC first and not to the student because that can cause a lot of unnecessary stress to the student. Yes, thank you. I appreciate you mentioning that. It is such a hassle to try and get any sort of diagnosis, to try to get any medical care for many people. Um, and this can be especially true for people with uh, disabilities and who are neurodiverse that um, know their needs and are constantly being shut down or pushed it off to um, another person, talk to this person instead, will you need a specialist? Um, that can be so, so difficult. Um, and yeah, talk to the DRC. If there is something specific that um, you're not sure how to meet that requirement, or if you're not sure how, um, how that works or why that wouldn't work for your class, talk to the DRC specifically. Um, but also, I think it's helpful for us to Again, generally put out there like, hey, 
let me know if something's not working. We can have a discussion about it and putting that open to all students. There might be anonymous uh, Qualtrics or something that goes along with that. So that people don't have to feel like um, they're going to be singled out, but uh, being open to those conversations is super helpful. Um, I mainly, sorry, I mainly wanted no, to ahead. add because in my freshman year, I had a, another TA say, I don't think I would allow that. And so it was 9 p.m. And I'm just like, you kind of have to. Like it was just, but not a lot of students would do that. And so it's just, if if it's written down and if that's going to be your first thought, please go through the DRC. Again, I'm sorry yeah. for butting in. No, no, no need to be sorry for that. Um, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. I mean, that's something too that, um, those conversations really do need to happen with the DRC. Um, and unfortunately, students aren't as protected by the DRC as they should be. So that's something that we need to be aware of too, that a lot of students are coming in um, feeling very vulnerable and sometimes scarred from their experience in other classes. And so that might be why even if they have the paperwork, they might not be showing it to you or they might not be going through the DRC anymore because this didn't work for me in the past, why would I bother? Is it worth my energy? It's noon. I blabbed a lot. Um, I appreciate you all being here. Please feel free to stick around and ask questions. Um, I'm going to turn off the, um, the recording. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to stick around. Um, I